So, back in the 70s, and I think it existed before and after, too, it's just when I saw it, there used to be a show on called ABC's Wide World of Sports, and all the old people go, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> At the beginning, there was a montage of worldwide sports, you know, not just American sports, but worldwide sports going on, sports being played, and the narrator said over it, spanning the globe to bring you the constant variety of sports. And he said a phrase that has lived on in infamy for old people. And that is, he says, the thrill of victory. And they show people winning, whatever it is, in a boxing match at the end. And people being lifted, lifted up on shoulders, boxers and stuff. The thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. And one poor guy became the poster child i mean other people there's like there might be a car that spins out in a race and wreck but the one thing that people remember is this yugoslavian or today we'd say slovenian ski jumper who is flying down an in run a hill for his jump and he wipes out he's he's trying to like get his lower center his lower center of gravity because there's like a snow fall just hit right before his jump and he gets kind of low for a second showed he got a low low and so he gets low but he loses balance and dude he bites it so hard he is flailing and limbs are flailing about as if independent from his body chandler bing there i mean it flies off it's crazy hits a building or something it is well here let's roll the footage okay so silently behind me go yeah why am i describing this um 1970 here he is this poor guy oh this is going to be a memorable terrible moment of my life dang that's a metaphor for when i asked out my first girl how it went but i mean it's just like whoa and he becomes the poster child for the thrill of victory oh no the agony of defeat. Uh, so you got like a montage of people getting the dub, people getting the W, like, yeah, the thrill of victory lifted up in the shoulders, and the agony of defeat. They take the L, and you're the poster child. And, and this is so much like life, because there's so many things that happen in life that are just like, what? That happened? You, you ask somebody out and they say yes, you know. Like, what? That had the thrill of victory. You have a child. What? There's so many things. And then there's so many things that's going down the in run for your jump. The agony of defeat. Wah, wah. And, and, and when that happens, you often sometimes think, like, that this happened. Does anyone care? Like, is there anyone, even when I get the dub, when things go well, who cares? Does anyone care? Like, sometimes it really feels like, man, this is one of those moments, I'm going to say it out loud, but I wish somebody would lift me up, put me up on their shoulders, because I can't believe this happened. This is such a great thing. Who's there with you? Who cares when there is the thrill of victory? And then on the other side, oh my goodness, man, when you bite it, when you wipe out, and sometimes it's not even a mistake, it's like... I couldn't have done anything about this. Just life happened. The agony of defeat. Who cares? Who cares? Is there any? And you think that sometimes. Like, nobody cares. Like nobody cares. Nobody is going to show up. And the, the level of pain that I'm feeling right now is so bad. Who's going to show up to support me, to empathize with me, to listen to me, or even maybe to give me some godly advice through this, to speak some reason and some wisdom? Uh, M Melissa, uh, Musa Saliba, a hunky stud at Momentum. He's in the tech room right now, so I'm only saying this because he's listening. <laughs> he's a major leader in our tech room. I can't brag on him enough, man. He is just such a servant-hearted, awesome, helpful dude. He's also an adult leader in our student ministry, Amplify, which is for middle schoolers and high schoolers. Uh, and he's a part of the men's mo group, Man Up. Um, and in, in the winter of 2021, uh, he, had, he had a difficult winter. He just said just emotionally and you know, spiritually, a lot of stuff. He was like, there was a lot of rope between me and God, like a lot of distance. And just things weren't going well. And he says, man, my RPMs weren't good. And RPMs are something I've shared before of like a way to check in on each other. How are your RPMs? And it's a way to just kind of like cut to, how are you doing really? How are you relationally, physically, mentally, spiritually? 
how are your RPMs? And he said, man, at the time, relationally, I had shut everyone out and I'd become a hermit. Now, when he shared this story with me, I have to admit, he did say, I shut everyone out and I became a hobbit. I was like, that's something different. That's really short, hairy feet, but also the hero. Um, but he was like, I was so isolated. <laughs> Thank you for letting me say that, Musa. I didn't get his permission. Um, he, was, he, he said, physically, I was constantly in physical pain from the anxiety I was feeling. Constantly in physical pain. Mentally, he said, it was hard to find light in the darkness. It was there. I just couldn't see it. So, so mentally, I was in a bad place. And then spiritually, he said, God's Holy Spirit was working around me, but I wasn't working with the Holy Spirit. And he just said, my RPMs were really bad. Well, follow that tough winter that carried into 2022. And in 2022, Musa Saliba was laid off from his job in January 2022. Three weeks later, he got an eviction notice. And he said, I, I was angry. I, I got mad. I was really, really angry. And it grew rapidly inside me. He said, it wasn't even necessarily just my situation. I was angry with people. He was like... Some of these things are instances of people of humans treating others like they're superior to others. And he was like, I was just ticked at people during this era. My anger was just growing from this. All this going on in the winter and then, man, getting laid off and then evicted. And so what he's saying is you, you kind of come to this point where you're like, who cares, man? Nobody cares. Some people are only thinking about themselves. They don't care what's going on. They don't care how their decisions affect other people. And he's just like, man, I'm so, I'm so tired. of I'm over people is kind of what he was feeling. He was mad about it. And I'm sure you can relate. Maybe you've gone through a tough patch, you know, rough patch, where you thought, who cares? Like, who cares that I'm sad today? Who, who cares that I'm feeling lonely in this season of life? Uh, who cares that I feel unlovable right now? Who cares uh, that, that I have a special needs child or, or a child with health conditions to where my life just looks very different than what other parents' lives look like? Who cares that I'm, I'm addicted and I need help? Who cares that I'm struggling with my mental health? Who cares that the Browns cannot find a kicker? <laughs> Does anyone care? I feel like no one cares. So it stinks when you have to wonder, do I legitimately have people in my life who would show up, like to put me on their shoulders or to walk with me through the agony of defeat. So this morning, I just kind of want to give you a peek under the hood to, to see how momentum runs. And, and what I mean by that is especially how the people of momentum or the people of Jesus' church beyond momentum, how they're cared for. Um, you know, the word care is a tough word because it doesn't mean just sitting around a pool of pity and feeling sorry and you know, for the condition of the world. It's more than that. And I think there's kind of a good definition seen in a, in a little story in Acts chapter 4 in the Bible. Um, so there's free paperback Bibles under the seats in front of you, or you can download the Bible app for free. But in Acts chapter 4, the brief background is this. Jesus has already died on the cross, risen from the grave, and ascended to be with the Heavenly Father in heaven. And so now... The church is a brand new thing. The church comes into existence. The birthday of the church happens in Acts chapter 2. This is Acts chapter 4. So the church is brand new. It doesn't even have an Instagram account yet. It is brand new. And so it's brand new, and it's, this is in the first century city of Jerusalem. And so it says this in verse 32. All the believers, the Christians... We're in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. They all felt like this is God's stuff. It's his stuff. I'm just, it's on loan to me. But they shared everything they had. So this is like a kindergarten lesson that they're living out. Like sharing is caring. And they're doing it. They're doing it. And so it says in verse 33, with great power, the apostles, those 12 designated by Jesus to be sent out into the world, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. We saw him rise from the dead. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. 
Now, this is a mind-blowing picture from the first century church, which at this time is just in Jerusalem. I mean, largely, it hasn't really exploded out of Jerusalem, which it will shortly. But I love that verse, verse 34, where it says, there were no needy persons among them. I mean, it almost feels like when you first read it, like, well, that's not, that can't be a realistic picture at all. That feels, come on, really? And so there's only two ways that that could have been achieved by the early church. To have that characteristic in a church, you got two options. One, you are very selective in your membership, and there are no needy persons among you. You know what I'm saying? Oh, you're balling? Well, welcome. You are balling. Come on in. That's how you do it, okay? Or the other way that that happens is the only way, of, the only other way to do it is to take care of the needs of people so that there are no needy persons among you. It's only two ways that happens. And so that's the deal. It's like you respond appropriately to every person's need. And that seems like one of the primary qualifications of the church in some ways. Um, you know, it's, the church should be about being good news to people the way that Jesus was good news. Uh, it should be about helping people win, uh, you know, whether that's relationally, emotionally, professionally, but most of all, spiritually, helping people win. And so what the church has learned is Jesus was filled with compassion for the lost, the broken, the lonely, suffering people. And, and, and the early church picked up where Jesus left off. And in this point in the stage in the game, they're doing a really good job at it because there were no needy persons among them. So followers of Jesus acted in ways that were appropriate to every person's condition, which is an amazing, beautiful picture. Uh, so how did, this is the big question then, how did the church do it? How in the world did they do it? I mean, the church was going, growing rapidly at this time. When you read through the book of Acts, there's these kind of signposts throughout the book that's like, and that day, 3,000 people were added to their number, like crazy amount of baptisms. And then 5,000, and then these verses keep popping up, and the Lord was adding to their number daily, meaning the church just kept growing. People keep saying, I believe Jesus rose from the dead. I believe he was the Savior of the world. He died for our sins. He conquered the grave. I want to make Jesus my leader, the leader of my life, my Savior. So the church just keeps growing rapidly. How do you keep caring for people when the church is growing rapidly like that and eventually breaking out into other cities? This is nuts. Well, one thing we know about the early church for at least the first 300 years is that people largely met together in small groups in people's little first century Palestinian houses. So there would be a citywide church in Jeru Jerusalem. This is the Jerusalem church. But they usually didn't gather all together very often. They met in people's homes in really small groups throughout the city, and that was the church. And so we get examples of this and hints of it all through the New Testament, which is kind of like Jesus showing up as God in the flesh and all the story after it that's in the Bible. Uh, and so a Christian leader named Paul wrote a long letter to Christians in a Greek city called Corinth, where the church now existed. And in closing shout-outs, as he often does in his letters, he says this, Aquila and Priscilla greet you. Can you not see that? I can see it. Uh, <laughs> Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord. This is a Christian couple. They greet you warmly in the Lord. He's writing his letter. And so does the church that meets at their house. Interesting, because if you've perused our website, this is what we call a Mo group. So Aquila and Priscilla hosted a Mo group, okay? Uh, so they greet you, but also the church, the Mo group that meets in their house. And then it says in... Philemon, verses 1 and 2, really little book in the Bible, it's, and it's just a letter from Paul. Um, it says, again, Paul says, Here, here's who it's from, Paul, and I'm a prisoner right now. And then he goes to say who it's to. To Philemon, also to Apphia, our sister, sister in Christ, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, meaning spiritually, he's battling alongside of us, and to the church that meets in your home. He's writing to a Mo group host, you know, someone who has church in their house. That's really interesting. And then the next one, Colossians 4.15, just another example. Give my greetings, Paul writes, uh, to Nympha, granted a very unfortunate name now in this day and age, okay? Can I just acknowledge that so you can get over it? 
all of us middle schoolers, and we can move on. Greet, give my greetings to Nympha and the church that meets in her house. Here's a woman who hosted a Mo group. She had a Mo group meeting in her house. The church met in a small group in her house. So how did people's needs not fall through the cracks when the church is expanding to different cities and blowing up in specific cities? The Church of Jesus was a collection of small groups, Mo groups, that met throughout a city in people's homes. Church buildings didn't even come along till the 300s. That's a historical known fact. And even there, a lot of them still met in homes, met in homes, met in homes. Eventually, people got away from that because we were like, well, this is the church. It's brick and mortar. No, church is the people, and it's out there. It's in the community. It's in homes. And so this is what happened um, in the first century. And, and that's, they met in these homes, and they, they looked out for each other, and they saw each other's needs as they rose up daily, those needs. Uh, at Momentum, we have Mo Group leaders, and what we largely tell Mo Group leaders is something along the lines of, you are a shepherd of 10 to 12 people. You know, roughly how many people might go to a Mo Group, give or take. 10 to 12 people, you are a shepherd of 10 or 12. So a sense, make sure that people are cared for in your group. Uh, and, and most importantly, what they do is they teach people in their group, one of the things is uh, to perform one another ministry. Ministry just means service. So serve one another. Let's, this needs to be like a one another ministry. Uh, so what that means is this. Right before Jesus was crucified, he said to his followers, uh, and I want to see if you can catch the theme here in this passage, he said, a, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, my spiritual apprentices, my followers, if you love one another. I think you caught the theme. And so that theme is picked up by Christian writers after Jesus in the early church, and it reverberates through the New Testament, this one another language. How do we treat one another if we are in the church of Jesus? Who taught us this and did this? Well, let me buzz through what it says in the New Testament. Here it is. These are scripture quotes. Be devoted to one another. Honor one another. Live in harmony with one another. Love one another. Stop passing judgment on one another. Accept one another. Instruct one another. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Hmm. Agree with one another. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Those are back to back. Serve one another. Be patient with one another. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Submit to one another. Forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Teach and admonish one another. Encourage one another. Encourage one another daily. Spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Encourage one another. Do not slander one another. Uh, love one another deeply. Live in harmony with one another. Offer hospitality to one another. Greet one another with a kiss of love. And then these are all separate scriptures. Love one another. 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 Sometimes I rap. Um, so listen, this is huge. I, I want you to understand this picture. This is the peak under the hood at Momentum. This is huge. As the lead minister... My job is not to care for everyone at Momentum. My job is to make sure that everyone at Momentum is cared for. And, and here's the picture of why Momentum is structured like this and why it works like this, and it's kind of stolen from the first century because we thought they did a good job. We were like, here's the deal is I could never care well for three or 400 or 500 or 600 people. I could never care well for each person and be the husband, the father, and the friend that God is calling me to be. And what we've learned from people who are children and grandchildren of ministers who did their best back in the 80s and 70s and 60s is like you often we hear like, man, yeah, my, my, my father was a pastor. My father was a minister. I mean, he was always there for the church. He was always visiting people in their homes, their hospitals, but we didn't see him much. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't get much time with dad growing up because he was a minister. He was a pastor. And so the idea is like, man, if I cared for each one of you well, one, I'd, I'd lose my health, I'd lose my marriage, I'd lose my kids, all of them. And I love you, but you're not worth that. I love my wife. She's a really good kisser. Um, and other stuff. So 
She's a great godly woman. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But the plan is it's not for one person, Dan Smith, or your Mo Group leader to love you well and care for you and to make sure you know that they care because they're directly taking care of you. The plan is for the church to love one another, to care for one another. And so a Mo Group leader tries to teach that to their Mo Group. They shepherd 10 to 12. Let's care for one another. And so who cares? Here's the great news. A whole Mo Group cares. And, and that's just a microcosm of, that, of the fact Mo Church cares. The entire church cares. But the way that functions is like in the first century in small groups within homes through amazing one another ministry. Uh, it's pretty cool. And so I, I think of life, and you can break this down kind of in a Mo group even, is that you got those two things that go on in your life, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. And the thrill of victory is in Mo groups, which are small groups of people who meet in mostly living rooms throughout Northeast Ohio, um, they take a break in the summer, and then they come back. And we're about to come back soon. We're going to be coming back, about to kick off again, Mo Groups, the week after Labor Day, so kind of the Monday of September 11th. That'll be the first week Mo Groups are back. And, and, and they, they care by celebrating with one another. When you have the thrill of victory in your life, you have a baby or a grandchild or something great happens to you or whatever, just like, yes. There's metaphorically a chance for people to put you up on their shoulders and cheer for you and encourage you and love you. That's the thrill of victory. Mo, Mo groups celebrate people's wins with them. It's the thrill of victory. And so uh, people need more Gatorade baths throughout the week, you know? If you watch sports, like there are just some, I mean, some people would never ask for you to celebrate, to rejoice with them, as scriptures say. But people need Gatorade baths every once in a while to be like, you did it. Or God blessed you, whatever. And to be like, whoa, Gatorade bath. And so it's just, it's such a great, sometimes in Mo Group, a lot of Mo Groups do this. If your birthday is coming up before the next Mo Group happens, we'll celebrate your birthday. We'll recognize it. And often, aside from maybe eating some cake or cupcake, cupcakes together, the group will go around and say things about you that they love about you and they'll encourage you. And some people don't get that any time throughout their life in the circles they're around, or throughout their birthday week even, from anyone else. And so at Mo Group, you're hoisted up on the shoulders. It's all, man, here's what we love about you. Here's why we appreciate you. And it's a way to celebrate the thrill of victory with them. Amplify, our middle school and high school student ministry, they make posters for each high school senior when they're about to graduate. And it's really cool because they got this big poster with that that graduate's name on it, and they decorate it up, and they sign it, and they write loving messages and encouraging messages on it and all that stuff. And when that senior comes home, we've seen it twice so far, they come home with this big poster with their name on it, maybe pictures and all these encouraging notes from middle schoolers, high schoolers, and adult leaders in Amplify. Who cares? Man, Amplify Student Ministry cares. Mo Church cares. Um, our young adult ministry and Mo Group, Hey Ya, is led by Jeremy Kunka, who's in the band today. And uh, they have a winter retreat in December. And last year, they talked about Luke chapter 15, which one of the stories in it is a, a, a kid that leaves home, kind of disses his father. Give me my inheritance now, like you were dead to me. And they go off and they party in the far off country. And then they come and they return home to the father. And Luke 15 is kind of like, man, like heaven rejoices when one of God's children returns home and reunites with God. And, and so in the months following that retreat, as they talked about that story, two of the members, Zach and Allie, started wrestling with the idea of getting baptized and following Jesus, submitting their life to Jesus. And, and the whole group really rallied around them as they asked questions about baptism, as they had these discussions. And one of the people that rallied around them was a guy named Eric Jeffries in that group who had just been baptized in October. And so in February 2023, they both made the decision, Zach and Allie, uh, to be baptized. One one day, one the next day, I think is how it was. And the group wanted to celebrate those baptisms together, including Eric's. So Jeremy and Crystal Speth, who are kind of like grown adult, old adult <laughs> encouragers, they host their group, hey, uh, at their house and are encouragers to them. They opened their home for a party where they had pizza and cake and all that kind of stuff. 
um, they played games together and they worshiped together to celebrate those three baptisms with those three people. And at multiple points through the night, they prayed for these new members to the faith and the new lives that they would lead in Christ. Hoisted them up on their shoulders and were like, let's celebrate your baptism that you've decided to follow Jesus. Who cares? Jeremy Kunka cares. Eric Jeffrey cares. Hey, ya cares. Mo Church cares. Um, our Rejoice and Recovery group, which is pretty new, uh, meets in the basement here Saturday mornings. Uh, it's a recovery group. And two weeks ago, a guy in that group just celebrated eight months of being clean from drug addiction. He had been, he had been using, I know, yay. He had been addicted, heck yeah. He had been addicted for over 20 years since he was 16 years old. And, and he was just filled with gratitude at this eight-month anniversary of sobriety, filled with gratitude and humility and just like all praise to Jesus kind of thing. And Russ Goodwin, who is the Mo Group leader for Rejoice and Recovery, he said, man, what a fantastic Saturday morning filled with lots of clapping and hugging and tears and just lots of love as they hoisted this dude up on their shoulders and were like, eight months, dude, eight months like, it's been since you were 16 years old that you were sober. Like, it's been that long since you've been sober. And so he said that young man was very grateful for the support that he'd received for the last eight months. Who cares? Rejoice and Recovery cares. Russ Goodwin cares. I guarantee you that if you're struggling with addiction or struggling with some other hang-up. And Mo Church cares. And the other part of that is just we, walking through people through the agony of defeat, walking with them. You know, when they take the L, even when something they can't control and it's like they have to grieve something, you know, just like Mo Group's rally to people who are in need or in crisis. And uh, Krista Tokar is, you know, great friend of ours, been a part of Momentum for a long time. She hosts a Mo Group called Cannonball and she hosts it in her home. And uh, not long ago, her mom passed away. And man, it was, it was after the previous Mo Group. She had just showed us a picture of her and her mom. And uh, her mom passed away pretty recently. And Missy Bauer in that Mo Group had a great idea of, what, what if we got her some wind chimes and we pitched in, got her some wind chimes that when she'd hear these wind chimes, it would remind her of her mom and be just like, you know, kind of a memento. So the whole group pitched in, got her some wind chimes and a DoorDash gift card, just appropriate gifts for what was going on. And it was just another great example. Who cares? Missy Bauer cares. Cannonball, Mo Group cares. Mo Church cares. And this is how it happens. Sometimes when someone in a Mo group loses a loved one and there's going to be a funeral. We've had Mo groups who are like, hey, the family's going to be out there during the wake or the viewing, the visitation for a long time, maybe during lunch or maybe during dinner. What if we provided some food in like the break room area so the family can get away, get a sandwich when they need a break or eat some vegetables and hummus or whatever it is. And there's other times where we've had a Mo group provide the entire meal after a whole funeral and be the one who, like, hey, we'll provide the meal for everyone after the funeral. You can invite them to. Uh, when Amplifier Student Ministry ha has, a, has a student that's in the hospital, Lauren Love, our student ministry director, has had students like, hey, let's, let's make them cards. Let's send them cards or send them little gifts. And they will take a stack of cards and, and be able, someone will be able to deliver that stack of cards and gifts and send all kinds of love and encouragement to that student that's in the hospital. Who cares? Man, Amplify cares. If you're a student and you feel like, man, all people do is say mean things about me in middle school and high school. Nobody cares about my life. Nobody understands what I'm going. Nobody cares. Amplify cares. Like Lauren Love cares. Momentum Church cares. Uh, continue Musa's story. Musa was baptized at Momentum in 2021 and... He, uh, he started going to that men's mo group that I mentioned, Man Up. And when Musa was let go from his job in January 2022, um, the mo group leader, Justin Hengel, he emailed the guys in the group and he said, you guys, we know Musa. Like he's, he's, he's in mo group. Can we take up a fund, like collect some money for Musa to help him right now since he's been laid off and now he's being evicted can we take up a fund? So that week, they started gathering money secretly and quietly for Musa. And I got, you got to understand, this isn't some scenario where it's like, we don't even know this guy. Why would you give money? You can make excuses on why not to give Musa some money here, but it wouldn't be because 
Musa's not trustworthy. He's one of us in this group. And so they were all, yes, yes. So they, take, they collect all this money, you know, for Musa. And, and that following Mo group, when they had it the next week, they gave him the money, and they gathered around him, and they prayed over him. And, and Andrew Bachna, another leader in Man Up, he said, I remember that being a very powerful and emotional experience. And, and so then Jim Orzek, who's also in that Mo group, Man Up, he opened up his home, and Musa moved in with Jim. And they're, they're roomies now. And all of this happened in a span of two or three months. In fact, another guy, John Kaiser, got Musa a job at where he worked at that time. All this in two or three months, they just rallied to Musa, who was in a really bad, angry place at that time. And when I asked Musa, can I have permission to share that story? I totally get if you don't want me to. This is what he said. He said, I think you telling my story would be a great opportunity to show the love of Jesus. And not only that, but also to show people how powerful Mo groups are. He said, and hopefully that inspires other men to come to our Mo group to be more like Jesus and to be a more Christ-centered follower. And one of the reasons I wanted to tell this story so bad is just because this is a story of men being generous and compassionate. Now, sometimes men are, and they just have trouble showing that or knowing how to show it or whatever. But usually when you think generous and compassionate, oh, cool, we got a story of a cool or godly lady. No, this is a story of a bunch of dudes gathering around another dude, giving him a chunk of money and praying over him, and another guy saying, man, that was powerful. Men who are generous and compassionate. Who cares? I'm a dude putting my head down, trying to take care of my family, but this is going on in my past, and this is going on at work right now. I'm telling you, Justin Hangel cares. Andrew Bachna cares. John Kaiser cares. Jim Orzek cares. Man Up Mo Group cares. Momentum cares. Who cares? Jesus' church cares. And one of the big points of this whole sermon is to say this. Why you need small groups in people's homes the way it happened in the first century church is because in a crowd of people, if you watched a time lapse today, the people coming in and out of this building or whatever, how in the world can anyone know what you're struggling with in a crowd? How in the world can anyone know in a crowd what little wins you had this week or what little losses you had or what agony of defeat you had this week? Like, man, I wiped out this week. I crashed and burned or I went through a breakup Coming in and out of a crowd, there's no way. It's just like the early church. 3,000 were added, 5,000 were added. That's even crazier. But how could anyone know unless you are in a small group community? And there, you're not overlooked. You're in 10 or 12 people. It's like, this is about our stories. This is about us doing one another ministry. This is about us celebrating with each other and mourning with each other. Rejoicing with one another. We, we can't know, people can't care for you unless you stop being anonymous. That's the only way that people can care for you is if they're connected to you and they know you. So as the lead minister at Momentum, it's not my job to care for every person directly at Momentum, but I want to make sure that each person at Momentum is cared for by getting them connected to a Mo group where that one another ministry can happen. And i got to be honest, when I asked this week, Mo Group leaders, tell me the stories of this happening. Sometimes people are so busy, you're like, oh, we'll be lucky if anybody can take the time, a Mo Group leader, to send us a story. I was overwhelmed with so many stories that I thought, we might be better at this as a church than we ever have been. And that's because early on, we had a few people when Momentum started who were like, one another ministry, I'll lay my life on the tracks to make sure I care for other people. But we largely, more and more, have people who are like, this is our job, is to care for one another and to do one another ministry with each other. And that's really exciting as a leader of Momentum to see that happening, our church getting really good at that. One last story. Uh, a guy named Fred Craddock was an old, amazing preacher. He passed away in 2015. He was 86 years old, and I've read a bunch of books by him. A creative preacher. I wish there was more audio recordings of him preaching because he was just a creative storyteller but obviously he grew up to be a preacher but when he was a kid he said his father was always criticizing the church and uh he said yeah his father's always saying you know they don't care about people they don't care about me church doesn't care about me 
And he said his mother took the kids to church, and at that time, in that era, Sunday school. And he said his father didn't go. And his, when his mom came home from church, his father would complain that dinner was too late or something like that because she had gone to church. And so sometimes um, the preacher would, would call Fred's father, and, and he would, you know, try to talk to him. And his dad would say, I don't know what the church wants. Anybody wants to talk to me. Like, they don't care about me. And he had this mantra. He would say, church doesn't care about me. He'd say, I'm just another name and another offering. Another name, or at that time, these, another name and another pledge. You know, the way I'd say it today is another butt, another buck. You know, butts, bucks, and baptisms. That's all it's about, right? And so he's like, no, another name, another offering. Said, they don't care about me. What's the preacher want to talk to me for? And so that's the way his dad always was. And sometimes the minister would come do what those old school ministers did, as I was saying earlier. They did everything. They'd show up at the house to do house calls, you know, house visitations. And they'd show up, and he'd show up just to talk to Fred's father, the preacher would. And his mom would get scared. She'd go hide in the kitchen, just nervous, afraid like tempers would flare and somebody would get hurt, you know, or whatever. And so every time, father would say, church doesn't care about me. Church wants another name, another offering. And Fred, Fred Craddock said, I bet I heard that a thousand times when I was a kid. His dad just beat that drum all the time. Fred Craddock said, there was one time he didn't say it, though. So his father was in Veterans Hospital, and he was down to 73 pounds. And he, they'd taken out his throat. Uh, he had throat cancer, and they, they told him it's too late, like there's really nothing else we can do at this point. And they put a metal tube in and x-rays that burned him to pieces. And, and Fred, who lived far away at that time, flew in to see his father, and his father couldn't speak, couldn't eat. And, and Fred said, I walked into his hospital room. He said, I looked around the room, and there were potted plants and flowers everywhere. And he said there was, there was a stack of cards 20 inches high next to his bed. Even, even the tray that you'd put food on if the person could eat had a flower on it. And he said he looked around, he saw all this, and all the flowers, every card, every blossom was from a person or a group at the church. He said, I looked around, it's everywhere, stuff everywhere. And he said, he, his father saw him reading the cards, and he sees Fred Craddock reading, going through all these cards from church people. Excuse me, church people, powerful story. And I, he, I'm reading all this, and his father looks at him. He sees him reading all of it, and his father grabs a Kleenex box from the side, and he starts to write a message on it to his son, Fred. And he starts writing, and he's, he was a well-read man, and he wrote a line from Shakespeare on the Kleenex box. And he wrote this, In this harsh world, Draw your breath in pain to tell my story. And, and Fred Craddock said, what's your story, Daddy? And he said, I was wrong. And Fred Craddock said, he, he was wrong. Like, you, you were never just another name, another offering. And I want to say that to you this morning. Like, you aren't either. Like, people want to care about you and for you, but if they don't know you, if you're anonymous, if you're faceless, people will never know how you're hurting. They'll never know what you're celebrating. They'll never be able to care for Who cares? I'll be honest. The people that you will meet in a Mo group will care. 